I'm Julie Zenner along with Mike Kreger and here's what's coming up on Almanac North. The Duluth Area Chamber Foundation released a survey of Duluthians this week. We'll find out what some of their top concerns are. The Minnesota Ovarian Cancer Alliance will host its 10th annual Light Duluth Teal Gala. We'll find out how that organization is making a difference. And the Minnesota DNR released hundreds of young sturgeon into the St. Louis River this week. Those stories and voices of the region coming up next on Almanac North. Hello and welcome to Almanac North. Thanks for watching. And Mike Kreger is in for Denny this week. Welcome, Mike. And tell our viewers just a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm a longtime uh, print journalist uh -huh. in the Duluth area. Not much experience with TV, but we'll give it a shot here uh -huh. and uh, see how it goes. All right. Well, we're very, very happy to have you on board. Thank you. All right. So let's begin with the news headlines. Sure. Members of the University of Wisconsin Board of Regents visited UW-Superior campus this week. Eight members of the Board of Regents toured campus with Chancellor Renee Wachter. The Regents also learned about the Superior Plan, which would build new athletic and recreational facilities to improve the campus and the community. The battle over future elections in Wisconsin continued this week at the state capitol in Madison. Republican senators voted to fire Wisconsin's election commission administrator, but Democrats say the vote is invalid. Meanwhile, Republicans in the House proposed a new redistricting plan, but Democrats say it would still result in biased district maps. Bow hunters in Minnesota and Wisconsin are gearing up for the archery deer hunt season, which begins Saturday in both states. New this season in, in Minnesota, any licensed archery hunter can use a crossbow to harvest a deer. In past archery seasons, hunters had to receive a special disability waiver or be over 60 years, years old to hunt with a crossbow. And Memorial Blood Centers announced a blood emergency today as the supply of blood producers is at a critically low level. Memorial Blood Centers distributes blood to medical facilities across the region. If you are able to donate, Memorial Blood Donor Centers are located in Duluth, Superior, Virginia, and Hibbing. You can go to mbc.org to schedule a donation. Last month, the Duluth Area Chamber Foundation commissioned a citywide survey of Duluthians. The survey identified top concerns of citizens about their community. The Chamber Foundation intends to use this information to help prioritize its areas of focus. Here to tell us more is Daniel Fanning, the Executive Director of the Duluth Chamber Foundation. Thanks for being here. Mike, hi Julie, thanks for having me. Yeah. So let's start out with what you found out with the survey. I know that you have said that there's not a lot of surprises, but what are, what are some of the top issues and how does the chamber go about reacting to those? Yeah, you know, we purposely took a survey of the entire city, not just our chamber members or our business community for this one. We've done that in the past and we're gonna to continue to do that. But for this particular survey, it was a citywide citizen survey. And we know the top issues of citizens are gonna be streets and public safety and housing. Those are the issues we keep talking about. <clears throat> uh, but this survey really helped reaffirm some of the work we're already starting to do and will continue to do. And really just, we, it's something that we wanna start setting that base for and making sure that we're working on the things that we know citizens care most about. And we wanna monitor that progress in the years to come. So this is not just about one election cycle or any kind of particular political race. This is really about holistically coming out of the pandemic, knowing that like many communities across the country, Duluth isn't quite meeting its full potential. We're seeing some progress on many fronts, but we also know there's more work we can do. I think everybody mm -hmm. agrees with that. So really making sure as a chamber and as a newly launched chamber foundation that we're addressing the issues that people cons are concerned most about. And we happen to agree with those based on what we're hearing from our own members and our downtown community and our whole wide citywide community. So like you said, there are no major surprises, but at the same time, there's value in getting that information directly from citizens to make sure that we're not just listening to a couple of people that are, you know, have strong opinions, but this is really pretty universal across every poll that we've had, most conversations that we've had. So no surprises, but it, it's good to identify those key issues. Mm -hmm. were, were you surprised at all about how those issues lined up in terms of, of the priorities? Because you, you may have anticipated what the priorities were, but right. how about how they aligned and, and you know how they were weighted in terms of respondents? That's a good question. There's been some shifting over the last year or two, and there wasn't necessarily scientific polling, which is why we wanted to at least start that process now. But just more anecdotally, I've been on this job for about a year. 
Our, our chamber president, Matt Baumgartner, has been on his job for about two, two and a half years now. And I mention that because we both get to come in as new people and kind of have that, that, that tour, if you will, going around and have those conversations and ask people questions. I can tell you that when I first, certainly first started, we heard more about public safety, and that did rank high in the survey results, but it wasn't quite as high as I anticipated it might be. I attribute that to, I think we've seen some progress, particularly downtown, still got a long way to go, don't get me wrong, but I do feel like in the past year or so, we've seen downtown come a little bit more to life. We know there's still issues there. So I was a little surprised that that didn't rank a little higher, but the housing issue we knew would be high and it was even higher than we probably anticipated. And that's just not only affordable housing, although that was what, what was identified, but we know we need housing of all types. And that's everything from affordable housing around the homelessness issue, but also, as we talk to our members, Cirrus, Essential, St. Luke, some of the larger employers in town, they're telling us that that's a major workforce issue as well. They need to attract and retain talents in our community and housing and child care and all these issues that were identified are a big part of that. So it's a huge issue. It's part of our economical issue. It's part of us as a community growing and really recovering from the pandemic. So again, the, the, the goal of this is to identify those things that we basically already kind of knew to reaffirm that and to now really double down on those efforts and continue to make progress. Mm -hmm. Your job and the chamber's job is to reach outside of Duluth to bring, you know, people right. to come in and invest and, um, and you know, kind of work with some of these issues. Right. But what do you tell, you have the survey, now you know what they, what they want right. or what they see as some of the issues. What's your elevator speech for yeah. someone <laughs> from Duluth? Yeah. The, the, yeah, the truth on what you're doing. The honest answer to that is it's time to invest in Duluth now. And there really are some positive gains that we've seen in recent years. The most obvious one, of course, is the nearly $1 million investment in our downtown with Accenture. And we're so grateful for Accenture and St. Luke's and Sears and all these companies that are doubling down and in investing in Duluth. And that's, that's a positive sign. And that's what encourages other developers, both local and from outside to come into Duluth and look at Duluth and say, hey, there's something going on there and that is positive. So our goal is certainly not to exaggerate the negative by any means, but it is right. to point out things like we are seeing some progress, but in order for us to sustain that and to really build on that momentum, we have to address some of these issues. We have to make it easier to build in Duluth. We have to make it safer. We have to make sure people feel safe. We have to fix the streets and I know people are working on that. So it's all these issues, but it really kind of begins and ends with housing right now and child care and public safety and streets. And those were the issues that were identified. And those are the issues we're already working on as a chamber. And, and you're right. Part of our job is to help those developers make progress and help recruit additional developers. But we do have great developers in our community. And believe it or not, sometimes it's not always the, the elevator pitches or the outside stuff that, that we do, although we do part of that. But sometimes it's, the, it's more behind the scenes work that people don't even see where a developer is just trying to get a permit through the process. And it's taking a little longer than he or she thinks mm -hmm. it should. So we get to help advocate for them. We reach out to our partners at the city and the county. And we've seen some good progress there, too. And that's where we're seeing a lot more groundbreakings this summer and open houses and things like that this summer. Things are moving along. Uh, but especially now with Ascension done and St. Luke's under, underway with their construction, we know that we want to use that as a catalyst to continue to see progress, not only in downtown, but throughout the entire community. And this kind of gives us the, the ability to, to keep running with that. Mm -hmm. With homelessness and housing being so high on the list of priorities mm -hmm. for, for citizens, um, and as you look at how, how downtown and its usage has changed since the pandemic, are there things that the, the business community and that the chamber can do to maybe merge those two yes. things where there are opportunities to develop housing downtown it. and that yep. it, it, there's space for it? No, you're, you're spot on. And that's exactly mm -hmm. where we're, we've seen some of that moving in that direction mm -hmm. already. We have, I can think of off the top of my head, three or four developers that are either currently working downtown and or at least interested in potentially doing some activity downtown around housing and possibly even some commercial investment. So that's our job, that's our task right now, and this has been clearly identified in the survey, and even long before the survey, we kind of knew this is what people wanted as well. Yes, there's maybe not a, overly a direct correlation, but there definitely is an indirect correlation where if we know there's more activity and the downtown task force that the, that, that task force that the mayor convened identified this as well. And we've seen this throughout communities throughout mm -hmm. the country where there's, when there's more activity downtown, people feel safer and some of the other stuff starts to go <laughs> away a little bit in the sense that people feel more safe, there's more activity, there's more activation. That's what we want to see downtown. So if we can help encourage these developers to develop housing downtown, and to work with the state and federal legislators, like you had mentioned, to get some additional funding for some, some more either affordable housing and or services that we can offer the individuals who need it, including mental health issues. All that together, there's not one silver bullet. It's a very complicated issue. And we, of course, alone aren't going to solve it, but we want to help contribute to that solution, of course. Mm -hmm. 
the foundation created to yeah. become a funding mechanism for the chamber because right. we can't always get grants That's right. um, and things like that. One year in. One year in. And how's it been going? And yeah, so you, you, you nailed it. It literally was created less than a year ago, and it takes a while to get up and running. We actually just, just got our tax deductible status a couple weeks ago, so it's still an infancy stages, but we're making progress in the sense that the chambers are long before I got there and long before even Matt got there. The, the chambers had a history of being involved in the community, leading the charge and the legislative stuff with Matt's leadership and energy and our great board's leadership and energy, and just knowing that our members are hungry for this growth and this positive momentum, you know, we're seeing the, the, the role of the foundation can be to, to acquire some of those funding that otherwise the corporate cha chamber wouldn't be able to. So we can get state and federal grants, we can apply for those as a 501c3, we can get private donations that are tax deductible, and it helps us just kind of be more proactive and actually address the core <coughs> issues of some of these issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, the corporate chamber, of course, is, does a great job of supporting the business community, but what the foundation can do is double down on some of the more, more activity, the more advocacy, the policy work, and of course that has to be funded, and yes, we. Are, we're hoping that people will step up and help with financials, but at the same time, we also need their input. We need them to continue to take these surveys. We want them involved, and I think collectively, we can continue to make progress. Mm -hmm. And the, the chamber co-hosted a series of candidate forums right. the, this week. We only have about 30 seconds, sure. but just speak to the importance of the chamber's involvement in getting those business issues out uh, front and center yeah, in the debate. That's exactly what it is. So it's a great partnership with the Duluth News Tribune, mm -hmm. and just making sure that we're making sure these candidates are addressing the issues that were raised in the survey that continue to be raised housing, child care, streets and potholes, all those issues. Those are issues that the Chamber is already working on. We will continue to work on that and other issues that we work on, including advocating for like the 148th Fighter Wing. And there's so much work that we're involved with. But to really start focusing on some of these issues, that's what we're going to continue to do. Well, Daniel, I know you're busy tonight. Uh, uh, we're heading down to the military ball right after this, yeah. and we're going to keep advocating for the 148th. We appreciate the men and women in and, and their service, of course. Thank you for coming in. My pleasure. Good to be your first host. Congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your first guest, I should say. It's time for Voices of the Region, our weekly review of stories being covered by area journalists. Our guest this time is Danielle Kading, a reporter with Wisconsin Public Radio. Some Wisconsin libraries are receiving requests to remove books that some community members say are inappropriate or promote certain gender ideologies. Uh, the requests come as libraries nationwide have faced record demands to ban books. And um, recently in August, a group of anonymous residents in the town of Iron River um, say they wanted to remove books that refer to transgender or LGBTQ plus issues uh, from their public library. Uh, the library's director, Jackie Pooler, said their board recently voted to keep the book Let's Talk About It um, after it was challenged. And she said this book uh, contains cartoon drawings that serve as a guide for all sexual orientations and that some of them can be pretty um, explicit. As we've seen nationwide, the American Library Association uh, has documented a record 1,269 demands to censor books and resources last year. Most of those books were written by or about the LGBTQ plus community or people of color. No one is entirely pleased uh, with proposed changes to wolf harvest regulations as the state is preparing to finalize its first major update of that plan in decades. Uh, the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources is proposing a rule that incorporates recommendations from that plan, um, which if you recall, it was first written in 1999 um, and later revised in 2007. Um, and basically that plan set a management goal of around 350 wolves in Wisconsin at a time when there was only like a couple of hundred wolves in the state. And since then it's grown four times that amount to roughly around a thousand wolves, according to the DNR. And now as part of this plan, um, as I said, they're incorporating um, some recommendations um, into these harvest regulations. 
Um, and some of them would be to promote uh, faster kill registration. So uh, hunters would have to register their kills within eight hours as opposed to 5 p.m. the next day. It would also provide protections for wolf dens, uh, making it illegal for people to harass or destroy a wolf den. Um, and there are also a few other changes, but essentially um, it drew mixed reaction, both the plan and these regulations during a public hearing this week. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers says Lakes Michigan and Superior rose less than an inch over the summer months. And that's rare for Lake Superior in particular, because um, what they say is that it typically rises an average of seven inches through August. Um, and again, it rose less than a half inch. Um, they say that's a directly result of drier conditions in the basin. And that's the same too uh, for Lake Michigan as well. Um, typically levels on that lake rise around four inches on the lake from May to July. And over the past year, we've seen less than average rainfall recorded in the Great Lakes Basin. For the Lake Superior Basin, it's been about five inches less rain than average during a, you know, a roughly 120 year period where they've recorded that. And uh, Lake Michigan has seen about three and a half inches or so less of rainfall than average. And as you know, we're still seeing dry conditions um, in the region. The latest U.S. drought monitor shows 96% of Wisconsin is abnormally dry. Um, the Lake Michigan shoreline has seen pretty moderate drought conditions, but here along Lake Superior's South Shore, we're seeing severe to exceptional drought conditions in some areas. In just over a week, the Minnesota Ovarian Cancer Alliance will hold its 10th annual Light Duluth Teal Gala at the deck. The event raises awareness of a disease that impacts 20,000 women in the United States each year and celebrates ovarian cancer survivors. Here to tell us more is Christine Greer, the Light Duluth Teal Gala Chair, who is an ovarian cancer survivor herself. And welcome back. You've, Thank you. You've been here a number of times over that those 10 years. Um, but for people who are unfamiliar with Light Duluth Teal, what does it look like in the community? Certainly. Well, it's a wonderful gala. Mm -hmm. We are there to support and, uh, you know, offer hope and inspiration to women who have been diagnosed with ovarian cancer, as well as their families. We have a wonderful event planned for next Saturday. Starts at 5.30. We have a, a cocktail reception followed by dinner, a very inspirational program, uh, live and silent auctions, um, games, um, a live singer. So, you know, and just a lot of inspiration, a very inspirational program. Mm -hmm. And you actually do light Duluth Teal. We do, we <laughs> do. This year we are lighting 10 structures teal in an effort to raise ovarian cancer awareness in the Northland and 10 because it's a decade. Mm -hmm. And some examples of those that would be the Anchor Tower and yes. uh, Pier, one, Pier B. Right, Anger Tower, Pier B, the Deck, uh, Glenshean Mansion, um, Peace Church, uh, Radisson, the list goes on. Yes. And I recall when you first started uh, with the foundation, mm -hmm. or, you know, mm -hmm. getting awareness in Duluth with lighting the lift bridge back in 2013. Did you ever think 10 years later you'd be at this level where you're... <laughs> <laughs> no, I really, I really didn't. I was just, you know, year to year and each year I was so focused on raising awareness and just trying to save lives in this community. I, I love the Northland. I grew up in Duluth and uh, 10 years ago I just wanted to support the women in this area. There, there wasn't a lot of support up here at mm -hmm. that time, um, but we are here in the Northland. Mocha is here. We have support groups here. We, we're here for w women and their families. Mm -hmm. What progress have you seen in either the treatment or the screening or both in ovarian cancer over this past decade? 
Well, the screening really hasn't improved. We mm -hmm. still need an early detection test, mm -hmm. and that is one of the reasons I'm so passionate about this cause. When I was diagnosed myself, I was shocked to learn that there's no early detection test. So I thought, I need to get on the bandwagon here. Um, as far as progress, we have seen um, better treatments and better develop, you know, developments over the past decade. Probably the biggest development has been the use of a drug called a PARP inhibitor. Mm -hmm. And let me get this straight here. So it's kind of a complicated um, drug, but it kind of goes after it. We try to prevent the cancer cells from um, uh, protecting, I'd say, protecting whatever word, um, the um, damaged um, tumor DNA. Mm -hmm. And so it tries to stop that cancer cell from reproducing. We have another class of drugs. One was just, um, just developed and uh, on the market now, and that's called an ADC. That stands for antibody drug conjugate. And that kind of targets the um, you know, cancer cells vulnerability. So there's promise. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of promise. And I understand that like short term right now, there's a shortage of drugs? Yes. Um, you know, for the first time in the, well, these past eight months, we have seen the worst chemotherapy shortage in the U.S. history. It's, it's very concerning. You know, no one with ovarian cancer should have to worry about getting a life-saving treatment. Uh, you know, cancer centers are working hard to, you know, manage their supply, and, uh, but they're being told to maybe um, tweak the dosages as well as, you know, the frequency. And, and that's, that's concerning. That's mm -hmm. very concerning. It's a very um, complicated issue. Um, there are manufacturers all over the world that, well, one in particular um, in India was shut down for, you know, quality issues. Um, there's been an increased, um, you know, demand spike um, there are issues with uh, some of the um, ingredient supplies, so it's very concerning. And at MOCA, you know, we are working hard with our um, national partners as well as legislative leaders to, you know, work on this supply and try to make this, you know, try to help. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's 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 a it's a tough one. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the lack of a, an early screening mm -hmm. system. Um, it is so important to catch any cancer early on. Are there symptoms in the early stages of ovarian cancer that people could be on the lookout for that, that might make it more likely that they would catch it? There are. It's mm -hmm. been called a silent killer, but we're finding that women actually have symptoms. They're mm -hmm. not often caught because they're so vague. They're, they're dismissed. For example, bloating. I mean, that's pretty common. Uh, difficulty mm -hmm. eating or feeling full quickly. Um, pain in the abdomen, as well as urinary issues. And we tell women if they have any of these symptoms that are, um, you know, progressing, or they have them for two weeks or more, that's not normal. They should go to their doctor and discuss. And if ovarian cancer is suspected, they really need treatment by a gynecologic oncologist because that specialty is so important and it will increase odds of survival. Mm -hmm. Are there things that people can do to reduce their risk? Um, there are some things that they can do, like having tubes, ovaries removed, um, birth control, and, and we list more on our website, mm -hmm. but there are, there are some, but women just really need to, uh, I think, pay attention to their bodies, and if they feel they're not being heard, you know, go to another doctor. I was stage three, and I really had no symptoms, so, you know, it was just um, kind of discovered during an annual exam, a mm -hmm. mass was felt, but it's a very sneaky cancer, but we, we tell women, listen to your bodies, and you know, go to the doctor if you don't think something is right. And sometimes they're told, um, you know, these are GI issues or, you know, you're constipated or whatever. And just keep pursuing, mm -hmm. you know, be, be persistent. This is your body and your health. And very quickly, um, still tickets available? Tickets are still available online through Sunday. And next Wednesday, the 20th, uh, we will open our um, auction online. So everyone's welcome to bid and uh, help us raise money for vital research funds. All right, Christine Greer with the Minnesota Ovarian Cancer Alliance. Thank you for coming in. Good luck. Oh, thank thank you. you very much. Thank you. All right. For the first time since 2000, the Minnesota DNR is stocking lake sturgeon in the St. Louis River. The prehistoric-looking sturgeon are a native fish species 
that were once abundant here, but declined in the 1900s due to overfishing, habitat destruction, and pollution. Sturgeon can live 100 years or more and weigh over 100 pounds. Here's more from a local DNR official. Female lake sturgeon uh, can take over 25 years to reach sexual maturity. And when they do, it, they may only spawn once every five to seven years, resulting in very slow natural reproduction. So the 375 lake sturgeon that we stock today are all about four months old and each fish has a unique tag embedded inside of it that biologists now and decades into the future will be able to monitor for their growth and the recovery of lake sturgeon in the St. Louis River estuary and Western Lake Superior. The St. Louis River is the largest freshwater estuary in North America and was designated a federal area of concern in 1987 due to legacy contamination. State and federal agencies and other partners have been working to clean up and restore the estuary hoping to have it delisted by 2035. Well, we're out of time, but you can keep up with Almanac North by following <coughs> us on Facebook and X, formerly known as Twitter. Keep an eye on the PBS North website for program updates, news about the station, and our upcoming events. And don't forget to download the PBS video app to watch your favorite PBS programs on demand. And Mike, thanks for holding down the co-host chair. Really it's appreciate pleasure. you being here. It's, uh, are you converted to a TV guy now? I'm still an ink-stained <laughs> wretch. I journalist, print journalism all the way, but this was an interesting experience, and I appreciate having the opportunity. Well, I think you show great potential, and I hope we see you back in the chair again. Thanks. All right, thank you. For Mike Kreger and the crew at Almanac North, I'm Julie Zenner. Have a great weekend. We'll see you next time.